Good day, I am Konita Hunter and this is The Ballot Box. The people themselves will lead from the front because the ANC has sold out the people of South Africa. For the first time ever, the DA is a candidate in every single ward in the country. Let us now go out there and take back our towns and our cities. We are the African National Congress and we've been serving the people of this country for the past 27 years. The African National Congress will deliver. Digital media has changed the dynamics of information from how it is disseminated to how it is shaped and consumed. It has created an opportunity for citizens to exercise their right to freedom of expression and enables others to challenge powerful voices. However, it has also enabled and emboldened those who wish to undermine democracy and those who wish to spread fear and anxiety. We have seen in elections around the world how some have used social media to push mis- and disinformation, incite violence and spread hate. This goes as far back as 2012 and every year as social media reach expands, the perils become more and more sophisticated. On this week's episode of Ballot Box, we discuss the phenomenon of mis- and disinformation and how it can affect the 2021 local government elections. Also, we ask, is Facebook doing enough? My guest today is passionate about the consequences of misinformation and disinformation. She takes no prisoners in her fight against fake news and the complicity of big tech in misinformation. Former MP and founder of the 2021 Local Government Disinformation Project, Mzile Fendam, thank you so much for joining us. It's so good to be talking to you today. Thank you so much for having me. So one thing very few people know about us is that we share passion for Fenty makeup, but we're not talking about that today. Oh, we, we can just talk about that. Let's just forget about the situation. <laughs> Let's talk about makeup and skincare. Well, that's also our shared passion. <laughs> the skincare is really where it's at. But, but today we have to do our day jobs and we have to talk about elections and disinformation. Let me start by asking Pumzile, why, why this particular topic? Why are you so passionate about it? It almost seems as if it's very personal to you. Yes, I mean, before I even left politics, this kind of anti-disinformation project was something that I thought should be set up. So it was an idea that I had, and I was already speaking to civil society, but it was something I was not going to be involved in because I was an MP, and I understood that because of my political affiliation as a member of parliament, I couldn't be involved. But because I understood the danger that misinformation would play in the election, I thought it important that it be established so that the integrity of the election um, be maintained. So the 2021 Local Government Anti-Disinformation Project is a collaborative program. You said that you brought in civil society, uh, so Right to Know, Code for Africa, Super Linear, Dr. Ray, David Rosenstein and Witness Africa. What do you hope to achieve? If, if this project is successful, what would that success look like? Yes, so it's a very multifaceted project. So there's the one aspect which is monitoring and combating misinformation, which unlike previous projects where it is just simply fact-checking, so kind of looking at parties' manifestos um, and checking whether information is true or not, it's very really sophisticated in that we use tech tools to kind of monitor what political parties are saying, so we look at media coverage to see what politicians are saying, to monitor how they're being covered. We also use social media listening tools. We're able to map out kind of the different narratives. We're able to map out the different camps using data science. So we're able to kind of see the different groupings. Um, so for example, we were able to map out kind of the general South African population and to see what they're talking about. 
we were able to identify kind of a grouping that's been influenced by the Trumpian narrative, the kind of anti-maskers, the anti-vaccination people, critical race theory kind of people. Then we're able to identify people that are kind of xenophobic, that put South African first kind of narratives. So by being able to identify those different groupings, then we can monitor the different conversations that they're having and any kind of disinformation narratives that may flow from that. So that's the kind of monitoring that we do, which is very really highly sophisticated and different from previous kind of monitoring that was done in, in, in elections, which was just purely fact-checking. So that's the one aspect. And then the second aspect is advocacy. So that advocacy is focused on the platforms themselves. Um, so for example, the were the allegations made by the whistleblower, which kind of confirmed what was already known about Facebook, for example, um, and the fact that they do not act against disinformation. And that was impetus for us to kind of push Facebook South Africa to break their silence. It's an election. And what Facebook usually does and what they did for the U.S. election, for example, was set up systems to monitor disinformation. They checked posts by different political parties. They added tags to say this is information from a political party. And they did not do that for our election. Um, so there was impetus for us to talk about that. So that's the advocacy focus on the platforms. And then there's a very there's a third aspect, which I think is very important, and which Dr. David Rosenstein is doing. So he's a a behavioral change therapist and a psychologist. So what we want to do is on those different groupings that we've identified is to understand the behavioral science behind why people believe the kind of disinformation that influences those kind of beliefs. So why people believe the disinformation that's behind vaccine disinformation. So there's been a lot of research into how vaccine disinformation, anti-maskers, that kind of beliefs get, gets radicalized, for example, into white supremacy. So that behavioral science, Dr. Rosenstein is looking at that. What we hope to do is provide uh, a report which makes recommendations about what needs to happen. So firstly, it maps out what the disinformation terrain looks like in South Africa, and then we make recommendations about what needs to happen, media literacy in schools. It doesn't need to be a public education campaign about disinformation. So it's quite a very broad and ambitious project, but I like to aim high um, and, yeah, Let's zoom in on Facebook uh, a, a little bit. The whistleblower Francis Hogan said, the thing I saw at Facebook over and over again was that there were conflicts of interest between what was good for the public and what was good for Facebook. And Facebook over and over again chose to optimize for its own interests, like making more money. Now, a lot of the allegations she made were very damning, but also not shocking at all. We've seen the weaponization of social media for disinformation since 2012, right? The question that I want to ask you is, if, if Facebook didn't care in the US election, why do you think they should care here? I mean, aren't you being too you know, hopeful that they would sort of um, come to the party? Well, I mean... They didn't care, but they at least took steps. And with the revelations that Francis made, you would at least expect that they would pretend to care. <laughs> they, they're not even making the pretense to care. And the simple truth of the matter is that given the amount of pressure they're facing in the U.S., they're facing in the EU, they're facing a lot of antitrust lawsuits in the US, they've had big fines in the billions from the EU related to privacy from, from WhatsApp. They're focusing their business on, on what's called the global south. And it's important for African countries in particular to start increasing the pressure on Facebook. 
So it's important for us to do this kind of advocacy. It's important for us to start applying the pressure. In simple terms, what does Facebook seek to benefit from allowing misinformation, in other words, fake news, about an election in South Africa, for example? Why would they not just put those tools in place to mark user claims as possibly untrue or or whatever it may be? Okay, just to explain in simple terms how Facebook works. So you recall, if you've had a Facebook account from the past, you will recall that the way posts, you saw posts on Facebook, they were in a chronological order. So you would see Pumzile posted this at 11, then it would be Kanita's post, then it would be John's post, and then it would be James's post. Then suddenly it changed. So for example, if I post something that's untrue and controversial, Say, for example, I say that I believe that Bill Gates is from Mars and uh, vaccines were made by aliens. Everyone's going to come in and say, Pumzile, this is not true. Or people will share it and look at this crazy thing Pumzile said. Or people will say, oh, look at this Pumzile said, said this true thing. So what happens is because I've said this thing, it gets a lot of engagement. It gets pushed up on the timeline. So this is what happens with this information. So as soon as something is controversial or not true, it gets pumped up. And the way that advertising works is when there is a lot of traffic on Facebook sites, when there's a lot of engagement, that is how Facebook it makes its money by selling engagement. So they don't have an incentive to remove that because they need to keep people logged on. So, for example, um, there was a time when a lot of big advertisers, there was a movement to say, withdraw advertising from Facebook. Um, And there was an internal memo where staffers were nervous and Mark Zuckerberg simply said, ah, don't worry, they will return. And they returned. And I think another kind of advocacy effort needs to be put on big companies to say, Guys, you should stop advertising on, on Facebook. But they still advertise it because they know people will stay on Facebook. But the fact of the matter is that disinformation has led to violence, but Mark Zuckerberg puts profit ahead of lives. And in South Africa, we saw, you, you, you know, to quote you, you said earlier this year that disinformation contributed to billions of rands and the destruction of property and to the loss of over 300 lives in July 2021. Politicians must not use their words recklessly and endanger lives. This was obviously a a call to politicians not to fall into the misinformation and disinformation trap. Now, let's talk about what happened in South Africa in July. Um, There was obviously this unrest that was sparked by the incarceration of former President Jacob Zuma. But a lot of the fear... And a lot of the violence was sparked as a result of misinformation and disinformation. And I can put my neck out further by saying a lot of what happened in Phoenix was as a result of that. So the reality of it is that you can't ignore misinformation and disinformation because the consequences are so palatable. What are the risks of misinformation spreading around elections unabated? What happens? So there is no more salient and frightening, absolutely frightening example of what can happen than July 2021. It shook the nation to the core. And I think we have become so desensitized by violence in South Africa, so utterly desensitized, that that seemingly has become forgotten. But it is still a serious risk. What we saw, for example, in the US, the narratives that were spread about, you know, the election being stolen, the election results not being accurate. A very similar thing can happen in South Africa, where just one political party says, oh, no, the IAC is captured, the election results are not correct. And in a climate where it has already been demonstrated 
that violence can result for disinformation. It can happen. In a tense environment where COVID has resulted in job losses, where people are tense, where people are stressed out, it can result in violence. So that's why it has been important for us not only just to monitor disinformation, but to guard against any incitement of violence. So we've been very quick also in instances of misleading content where it is not specifically disinformation, where we could report an incident where it's false information and in violation of the ISC code of conduct. Uh, you know, when Helen Zilla started making remarks about the Concord being captured and the ANC collaborating with the, the ISC and the Concord, it was important for me as a private citizen to say, no, you shouldn't say that. Where's the evidence of that? Or Herman Mashaba's comments about foreign nationals, an environment where there is examples of violence against foreign nationals where we've just emerged from a situation where there was violence it's important to say no do not make those kind of remarks where he rolled back and softened how he said about that because he has freedom of speech and he can say look the law this this and that but be careful how you say it i think it's important for all of us as people who value the constitution, as people who want us, our country to move forward, to all take a stand, to all demand better of our politicians, to all hold them to a higher standard. And I think as South Africa, here's a remarkable thing I noticed about us. I was talking to someone at the UN who was talking about hate speech and we were kind of brainstorming ideas about how to tackle hate speech and how parliaments can contribute. And I realized that we have a very active online community where if something is posted online where it's racism, our online community will shut that down. But I mean, obviously that comes with, you know, educating people. I had a conversation uh, with my 71-year-old father-in-law over the weekend uh, who is, you know, a participator in fake news through WhatsApp. I mean, he doesn't know better. Someone sends something to him and he'll and he'll forward it on. And he, and he asked me, how do I know that this is fake news? And I said, you just have to be discerning. And we take it for granted that we are able to discern fact from fiction. But a lot of people don't have that luxury. But Pupsile, you are a reformed politician, right? <laughs> or a recovering, a recovering politician. And you know that your former colleagues tend to bend the truth a little bit. And that's what they do. That's the currency of politics, right? So how do you then monitor, but also ensure that politicians like Helen Ziller don't continue making these unfounded claims? Because calling them out is one thing, but how do you then institute real consequences for uh, lies perpetuated on social media by politicians? Yes. I mean, firstly, in terms of the online space, so our simple message is always that for everyone, if you go online, I think you must just understand that given that it's we live in a digital space, you must just operate under this assumption that someone quite likely might lie to you. And what you read, you must be careful. So I always just ask people to stop and ask yourself, is this true? If you're not sure, ask Nita <laughs> if it's your father-in-law. Ask someone that you know will quite likely have the facts. You know, my mother asks me, she always, she always sends it to me and says, is this true? And then I'll say yes or no. And then she'll go back to the WhatsApp group with all of her friends and say, no, she said it's not true. <laughs> for our elders, I think it's important for us as young people to also educate them. WhatsApp is the main method of communication in South Africa. And I think it's how a lot of people receive information. And it's a space that can't be monitored, you know, because it's private communication. So it's just a matter of educating our elders. And then in terms of politicians, in an election cycle, you know, the ISC code of conduct is in force. 
where you can report a politician for false information and they're very heavy sanctions. But it's active citizenry. And that's what it boils down to at the end of the day. It's about South Africans demanding better. But I mean, things things are looking a little bit, I mean, I, I like to look at the silver lining. And I was on a panel around misinformation quite recently with a representative from the IEC. And they seem to be taking it quite seriously and putting a lot of resources into this, you know, compared to previous elections. And the point that they were making is that misinformation has become so part of elections that you can't talk about elections without talking about misinformation. And they've obviously come up with a code of conduct that parties who violate this uh, code of conduct by spreading disinformation, false, inaccurate, and misleading information can be fined up to 200,000 rand. They have to give up their party election deposit. They may even uh, be stopped from working in an area. Um, So I think that we are ahead of other countries in that we are aware of the consequence of it and there are some mechanisms in place. So is it is it good to be looking at that silver lining also? No, no, no. I mean, yeah, that is in place during election time. I guess I was just speaking about the greater philosophical question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for that. I'm here for that. <laughs> I, guess, I guess that was a deeper question. <laughs> No, but for misinformation, definitely, they're definitely solutions. And that's what we're looking at. The IC code of conduct, and I, I'm hoping the behavioral science aspect of things will provide solutions. I guess um, you caught me. <laughs> we were like, well, how do we reform our politicians? <laughs> and, and I guess that was, I was like, oh. No, I appreciate that. The behavioral science part of it is very interesting for me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Because it, it, we need to understand the fundamental question. And even when I was doing honest research on Bal Pottinger and, and disinformation and misinformation, the question that I sort of wanted to understand, you know, why would someone, Tiboho from, you know, Tswane, share a picture, a clearly distorted picture of a journalist, me, nobody really, clearly you know, distorted uh, in a way to perpetuate false information, why would this person share that particular image? You know, that that was something that was at the back of my mind. Why do people share false information? And I think you're definitely um, hitting the nail on the head by getting that research done and coming up with some solutions. Because at the end of the day, it's almost like an, uh, you're dealing with, with drug addiction. Social media is an addiction. So you have to get to the core of why do people do what they do in order to solve the bigger problem. Absolutely. Um, you need to understand it in order to provide the solutions. And at the end of the day, it's a behavioral issue. I mean, you can't all just knock on the platforms. You also need to change the way people consume information online. Um, it's not just the platforms to blame, but also individuals. How do you change how people consume online? How do you educate them? How do you stop them from being manipulated Um, because it's very easy to manipulate someone and radicalize them. We hope to answer those questions, understand the landscape of disinformation in South Africa and hopefully find the solutions. I'm I'm, I'm positive about that. I'm I'm absolutely positive Um, and I'm hoping we can contribute to the greater global debate because it focuses too much on the platforms and not as much on behavioral change. So hopefully we can start also a movement of the global south um, and South Africa can be the leader on the continent against the platforms because they're turning their attention to us. And we need to lead the debate to say, not on our backyard, we will not be exploited. So as we wrap up from Zilef and Dam, what is your message to Mark Zuckerberg? in the context of the South African local government elections that's coming up, if you have to say, hey, Mark, what would that be? You have an opportunity here to meet us halfway. We do not want to shut down Facebook. Um, I think Facebook should continue to operate, but I think there's an opportunity to demonstrate goodwill to South Africa. There's an opportunity in the small window that's left 
to take steps to say, you know, we will monitor disinformation in all level languages. This is what we'll do. This is what we'll do. And then after the election, begin a conversation about monitoring disinformation going forward in order to prevent a situation where government starts thinking about uh, regulation, which might start infringing on free speech. A conversation must be had, uh, one of solution seeking and not an acrimonious one. Thank you very much, Pumzile Fandam. Thank you for your time. Keep fighting the good fight. And we will meet on the Twitter streets, if not in person. Thank you. Thank you. This brings our show to an end. This episode of Ballot Box was presented by Conita Hunter and produced by Shante Schatz. The music in this episode is courtesy of Getty Images and Epidemic Sound. For more elections content, go to news24.com forward slash elections.